As longtime Rick and Morty fans, we were very disappointed to hear about the felony domestic violence charges against co-creator Justin Roiland earlier this month, as well as the new allegations of his inappropriate conduct and messages with women and underage girls. And just a quick heads up, in this video, we are not gonna get into the specifics of the accusations against Roiland. So if that's the sort of thing that you just do not feel like hearing about today, you're good, we're not gonna get into it. Now, Roiland was promptly dropped by Hulu and Adult Swim, though Rick and Morty is set to carry on without him. While Roiland has been roundly condemned, his ousting raises the age-old question of whether we can separate the art from the artist. You're not gonna believe this because it usually never happens, but I made a mistake. Is it possible, much less moral, to continue to enjoy the art of bad people? Well, let's find out in this Wisecrack edition, can we separate the art from the artist? Now, philosophers and artists alike have been chewing on this question at least as far back as Plato, which is very far back. Plato's older than Jesus. Now, for Plato, Art is a sort of imitation, and at its best, it exhibits a beauty that reflects a type of moral goodness. However, because art is also influential, he was worried that it could persuade people via emotions, thus distracting them from actual truth and morality, what he called the forms. Now, this is why in The Republic, he's skeptical about having too many artists, if any, living in his ideal city. Plus, they probably wouldn't be able to afford rent and would have to live in like a neighborhood on the other side of the river from Plato City where lofts were cheaper. But in recent history, it's gotten even more complicated, specifically since the early to mid 20th century, a time when Western fine art and art criticism was overtaken by formalism. As Eric Atala Mathis explains in his book, Drawing the Line, formalism was the view that the nature and purpose of art did not extend beyond the formal features of the work and the relationships among them. Painting was about line, shape, color, arrangement, and the way that these formal features evoked a distinctive aesthetic response in the viewer. Similarly, other forms of art were increasingly appreciated solely for their formal aspects, rather than their context, whether historical, political, or as it pertained to the artist. This was an era of art for art's sake which is easy to understand when you're looking at things like abstract expressionism, which is probably why formalist criticism flourished at the time. But it's a lot harder when a piece of art is obviously meant to be engaged with based on its context. Take Picasso's Guernica, which was explicitly commenting on the violence of war. Or uh, more recently, take a song like NWA's the Police, which was about, well, yeah, you get it. It's, it's, it's basically all there in the title. However, Mathis notes that the influence of formalism was predictably short-lived. And in recent decades, philosophers and other experts have returned with gusto to examining questions about the ethical criticism of art. That's why nowadays, plenty of people take for granted the fact that art can be morally bad, like the people who create it. If Guernica is a moral triumph for its condemnation of violence, wouldn't a painting say, glorifying violence, necessarily be the opposite. But even if art can be morally bad, does that moral ugliness necessarily make it aesthetically worse? So for example, take a song like Blurred Lines, which has a morally terrible take on consent, but does that preclude it from being a banger, you know, on a musical level? What rhymes would hug me? Is the song less good because the lyrics lack moral value? Now, according to one ethical criticism of art, the way you reconcile ethical and aesthetic criticism is, as Mathis puts it, by looking to what the work asks of us. Many works of art aim to elicit specific responses to the work. They urge us to feel certain ways or think particular thoughts. Mathis notes that the same way a joke becomes less funny when the timing sucks. Ooh, you're not frying this out of my hands. <laughs> it could also be less funny because it's racist. Why don't we just defer no to case. Mr. Um, Mr. Brown. Ah, oh, all right. Okay, first test. I will not call you that. Well, it's my name. It's not a test. In this way, the morality of the content becomes just another one of many features of the work of art that makes it better or worse aesthetically. To really drive home the point about how tricky it is to assign morality to art, the author brings up notable failed painter, Hitler. Obviously, Hitler was one of the most heinous human beings ever. Hot take, I know. His art, however, had nothing to say. The paintings were largely just tranquil cityscapes. So while you might not want one in your house, the art itself isn't particularly immoral because it doesn't ask you to subscribe to, you know, Nazism. I'm thinking that maybe that painting could be an original Hitler. Yes! Yeah! Holy shit, dude, this is huge! Now in this way, Mathis writes, 
the relevance of the artist immorality needs to be established. Mathis further distinguishes between moral condemnation and aesthetic criticism, arguing that sometimes art is good even if its creator is morally reprehensible. I am for the opposite in my life, making horrible art, but being a great guy. On the other hand, some moral flaws in art can impact our aesthetic interpretations, or at least our reactions. That's especially true when the circumstances of the work's creation reveal some moral ickiness. Okay, now take a song from one of my favorites, Aaliyah. Now her song, Age Ain't Nothing But a Number, was a banger. but it gets pretty gross when you realize it was performed by a 15 year old and was written by the 27 year old she was secretly married to at the time. You know who it is, R. Kelly, a man who's since been accused of like a hundred sex crimes and is officially on the you can't do karaoke of his songs list. Now maybe you can set this aside because you just love the song or maybe you change the station every time it comes on. The moral and the aesthetic aren't necessarily intrinsically connected, but depending on our own individual ethics and experiences, they can be. Mathis establishes three categories to help us parse through this debate. Now one, there's the moral criticism of a person, the artist. Two, the aesthetic criticism of an artwork. And three, the moral criticism of an artwork. Now the first two are straightforward, if open to individual interpretation, but the moral criticism of an artwork is tricky. Now, as Mathis writes, we reserve moral criticism for people, not objects. The knife-wielding murderer is bad. The knife is just a knife in the wrong place at the wrong time. However, that doesn't make art morally neutral. As Mathis adds, because these works call on the audience to have certain responses to their content, we can ask whether those responses are fitting morally or otherwise. Now, cliche examples here include things like Triumph of the Will or Birth of a Nation, both formally impressive films that promote violently hateful worldviews. In perpetuating these worldviews, they prompted immoral responses in many viewers. These questions come up every time Woody Allen makes a film, or when we examine the films of Roman Polanski. For decades, cinephiles have defended these men, often by disparaging their victims. This defensiveness suggests that a lot of people can't separate the art from the artist. So they need the artist to be innocent or for their offense to be not that bad. Thus exhibiting the inability to accept that bad men could create good films. Particularly in the case of Alan, much like R. Kelly, the very things he's accused of are in his films, making it difficult to let his art exist in a vacuum. Twins, Max. 16 year old. Can you imagine the mathematical possibilities of that? As Mathis points out, this raises the moral stakes of the artwork by engaging the audience in a more specific project, one aimed at redeeming the artist themselves. A work that asks you to empathize with a character who exploits their power for sexual gain, made by an artist who exploits their power for sexual gain, seems to be part of a project of moral redemption. In Of the Standard of Taste, philosopher David Hume concluded much the same, arguing that when vicious manners are described without being marked with the proper characters of blame and disapprobation, it makes the work immoral and our participation in it equates to complicity. This might be why people feel the need to loudly defend artists who have done some awful things. Maybe we worry that our consumption of their work is a tacit endorsement. Or maybe we even feel like we're taking part in their redemption. In order to keep that uncomfortable feeling at bay, we have to tell ourselves either they didn't do anything that bad or that we aren't in fact endorsing them just because we like what they make. But then you got people like Dave Chappelle, who in response to being dragged for transphobic jokes, doubled down and made it central to his brand. Louis C.K. did basically the same, turning much of his act into an aggrieved reaction to being canceled. He was rewarded for this artistic turn with both a Grammy and sold out shows in Madison Square Garden, proving once again that cancel culture works out pretty great for some of these guys. That's why many address the morality of artwork by wondering whether we become complicit when we spend our money on an immoral artist's work. Now this is tricky because as we've seen, even widespread condemnation of an artist doesn't mean they won't still have an audience. But just because your individual monetary contribution is a drop in the bucket, that doesn't mean that on a personal level, we shouldn't grapple with giving our monetary support to bad people. But it becomes more complicated when we think about, say, 
buying a Norman Mailer book after knowing he abused his wife, or visiting the Picasso Museum, dedicated to a famously abusive and misogynistic artist. These artists aren't impacted by our money. So once an artist dies, does their art suddenly become morally neutral? Well, probably not. This suggests it's pretty myopic to tie our moral compass to economic outcomes. And as we've talked about in a recent video, trying to do ethics within a capitalistic framework can be a potentially tough hang. But just because your counterfeit ticket to a Louis C.K. show doesn't make a huge difference for his tax bracket, it doesn't make the questions surrounding art and morality insignificant. Money aside, it makes sense to struggle with your own complicity when you consume the work of an immoral artist. That's because, as Mathis puts it, morality is fundamentally social. It's about how we relate to each other. And as such, what is expected of an artist who screws up and what is expected of their audience is social too. When people lament cancel culture, the real underlying question is often, what is our social responsibility to each other when we seriously mess up? Because if an actor or comedian or musician can get canceled for something, what if I do the same thing? or my brother, or my best friend. When, and if ever, should a person become irredeemable? But a lot of times, our short-term memory culture acts like a temporary timeout accompanied by a temporary loss of income is sufficient penance. That's even if the artist in question has made no attempts at making amends or growing as a person. Continuing to talk about their accountability is denounced as just more cancel culture. But this typically ignores what people are actually asking for. It's usually less about vengeance and more about wanting people who've done shitty things to publicly acknowledge their actions, address how they're going to change, and work to make sure the culture around them changes too. Community showrunner and Rick and Morty co-creator Dan Harmon has been accepted back into the fold after his apology to a community writer he sexually harassed. Now, he took full accountability for his actions rather than raising doubts about the victim's claim. He apologized thoughtfully, and he began working to make the entertainment world more equitable by diversifying the Rick and Morty staff and starting a podcast with comedian Jessica Gao to talk about the way these problems manifest in the comedy world. But what does it mean for diehard fans when their beloved creators fall short? This predicament can be especially hard for what philosopher Ted Cohen calls effective communities, i.e. groups that have made being a fan of a person or their work a huge part of their personality. I'll be honest with you all, I've done this with The Grateful Dead and probably other things. I'm curious about you all. What effective communities are you members of? Who have you made a part of your personality? I wanna hear, unless it's Ted Kaczynski, then don't say anything. Effective communities have to figure out how to reconcile the communal bonds they've formed and the positive experiences they've had with various unsavory revelations about the creators. Take Leaky Cauldron and MuggleNet, two of the largest Harry Potter fan sites, who, in light of J.K. Rowling's anti-trans views, publicly rejected the author. Now, while many fans have rejected all things Harry Potter outright, MuggleNet still engages with things like the Fantastic Beasts movies and the Hogwarts Legacy video game, but does not cover any J.K. Rowling-related news or use her likeness. For a community that has revolved around Harry Potter since 1999, this is how they've chosen to deal with a disappointing creator. Or take the Joss Whedon fan site, Whedon-esque, which was started in 2002 and completely shut down after news surfaced about the bullying and harassment that took place on his sets. This choice suggests its viewers could no longer stomach their fandom. In the context of effective communities, it makes sense why the news about Justin Roiland has been so shocking. Rick and Morty has an active online fandom that uses digital spaces to celebrate the exploits of their favorite geriatric mad scientist. And via videos and podcasts and streams, we've participated in this community here at Wisecrack quite heavily, you might have noticed. How this effective community will navigate the aftermath of these allegations remains to be seen. That said, we do think the situation is unique given that television has a really specific role in the history of art and entertainment. In particular, it's one of the most collaborative mediums, requiring lots and lots of people to achieve its vision. So in the case of Rick and Morty, it's not the singular artistic product of Royland. And in fact, according to a recent Hollywood Reporter article, Royland hasn't really done much in the last few seasons other than offer his voiceover work. Instead, the show is largely the product of teams of writers, 
producers, animators, designers, and assistants, many of whom have fun Twitter feeds and seem like great hangs. Which means that, at least in this particular case, like not only can we keep enjoying one of our favorite shows, but the calling the show itself immoral doesn't really make much sense. And more generally, it seems that while it might feel good to have black and white moral approach to this issue, one in which we always know the exact line between art that we're still allowed to enjoy and art that's on the forever ban list, things aren't so simple. Deliberations like this involve moral grappling on the individual level, often based on our unique perspective and life experiences. You might be comfortable watching a movie or viewing an artwork that makes your best friend feel gross, but maybe that's okay, as long as you're each doing the work of honest moral interrogation. All I know for sure is that you will never catch me checking out Manhattan from the grocery store red box. But what do you all think? Does an immoral artist make the art immoral or is there a clear distinction between creator and creation or does it even matter? Please let us know what you think in the comments. Thank you so much as always to our patrons who participate in a very fun, effective community with us. If you feel like joining that community, being on our Discord, getting extra audio and video content, getting videos early with no ads, check out the link in our description. But if not, thank you so much for being here, for watching our videos, for leaving comments, for liking, for helping us create the space to have these discussions. It means a lot and we really appreciate you. So thanks so much and we'll see you next time.